We've seen the rise of woke capitalism to a great degree in the last, well, let's say since 2008. Um, it seems to me that, you know, there's a fair bit of unrequited and maybe deserving guilt on the part of high-flying capitalists who made their money in manners that might be a little bit more crooked than necessary, and that one of the ways they can pay the piper, hypothetically, without actually having to go through any serious moral revaluation, is to beat the ESG drum, for example, on the climate side, or to pretend to be in accordance with, that, what, 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 with whatever the newest woke delusion is on the civil rights front. And so it's a false contrition. And I think that's emerged in the aftermath of unpunished malfeasance, let's say, on the corporate front with regard to the financial crisis of 2008. The ESG thing is, I think, just another version of the same ratings agency scam that um, we saw with mortgages. It's just that they're, <laughs> they're playing around with different terminology and insider, um, you know, sort of rigging of the game. Uh, this time it's more political. That doesn't seem to be working out so well for Disney. Right, exactly. Uh, you know, I, I, I think these schemes always, when, whenever they try to get, uh, you know, game the system too much that way, it, it always ends up seeming to backfire, um, I think. Yeah, well, that, 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 it does backfire if the market, if a well-regulated market actually retains its dominance. Because as you pointed out too, you know, the people who are playing the capitalist game honestly, and that's the majority of people who are conducting business in the U.S. because otherwise the U.S. would not be as filthy rich as it is and so unbelievably stable and productive. Right, because things actually get done and they work. And that means that people who actually get things done and work are doing those things. Now, there's a handful of bad actors on the capitalist side, and it's definitely not in the interest of honest capitalists to let the din dishonest crooks game the whole system and get away with it on the regulatory capture side, et cetera, you know? That's really a place where the left and the right could come together. I mean, look, under Trump, we had no wars. You know, that wasn't such a bad thing. And we did get the Abraham Accords and the economy did quite nicely. And I don't think the culture wars were raging as intently under Trump, even though they raged away quite madly as they are now. So, you know, for all of Trump's purported dangers, he was much less of a threat, certainly on the international stage than he might've been and that everybody had been afraid he would be. And I do think also that he generated a certain degree of respect and apprehension from, you know, the more authoritarian types around the world. And I certainly don't think that's the case with Biden at all, because I think Biden, like Trudeau, I think is beneath contempt in relationship to people like the president of China. So, and I don't think that was true for Trump because at least he was unpredictable or had that appearance. So I don't, I don't think you were out of line in your failure to see anything truly malevolent in Trump. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, my impression of him was that he, he was doing this for a lot of reasons that, that, that it was complicated. He, he has a, a mischievous streak in him. Um, it was, it was clear watching his family early in the campaign that they wanted no part of any idea that he might win. Um, but and I wasn't exactly sure that he wanted to win. But, right, um, right. Yeah, well, I thought it was an exercise in brand awareness expansion, at least, and quite a brilliant one in some ways, if if you're thinking purely from the perspective of sales. Right, and and he was selling himself the entire time, and he was doing a great job at it. I mean, you know, the, with the tools that were available to him, uh, he was a pioneer in many respects, by bypassing the media and going straight to uh, people using Twitter and that sort of thing. Um, all that was very interesting, and I think that was something that if people had looked honestly at the situation, they would have found really compelling uh, to study. Instead, I, you know, uh, the establishment press just settled on a narrative about him about halfway through the campaign. And from there, it was just attack, attack, attack. And it became, um, I would say, on a, a sort of ongoing, uninteresting diatribe uh, yeah, from that yeah, point forward. Yeah. yeah, well, it would have been a lot more compelling had there been real journalists covering the Trump phenomena, trying to figure out what the hell was going on, because at minimum, it was insanely interesting and not predictable in the least. And 
and mysterious, and it would have been good to get to the bottom of it. Like I said, I think Victor Davis Hanson did a nice job in his book, The Case for Trump. I, I think it's a very even-handed treatment uh, of, w without the kind of crazy gonzo journalism style that, you know, might have added something quite compelling to the, to the overall analysis of Trump.